Thank you, Carol. Really appreciate it. And thanks, everybody, for attending. Um, I'm Michael Hoffman, as Carol said, and um, I am the, let's see, there we go. I am a certified SANS instructor. I wrote the SEC 487 OSINT course for SANS, and I enjoy all things OSINT. Uh, in my free time, I am looking at social media, looking at how we can grab information, transform it, find interesting pieces. And I think uh, you're going to be really, in, you're going to really enjoy some of the things that John and I have found today. Um, my website right there, webreacher.com, has a whole bunch of links to different projects and things that I have done in the past. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. My name is John Turbush. I'm a SANS instructor. I also helped uh, some of the development for the new course. And my background is a private investigator and researcher. Uh, nowadays, I am doing threat intel uh, work. So doing a lot of OSINT uh, for a long time, and hopefully we can share some useful information with you today. Cool. Thanks, John. So John and I have been looking through social media platforms over the past couple of months while we've been planning this webcast, and uh, I don't need to show you all of the things that happen on social media. I mean, this is a really neat infographic here from the Visual Capitalist of everything that happens on social media in one internet minute. It's amazing whether it's number of YouTube videos uploaded or Facebook, we push so much data up there to the internet. And you know, John and I aren't, aren't here to tell you that social media is bad or, or you should, you know, get off of it or if you're doing OSINT that it's going that you're going to, you know, find everything on social media. But there are some neat places that John and I noticed people weren't necessarily looking or at least weren't publishing information on. And some of these sites that we're going to talk about and show you today, um, I think are going to be really neat for us to, to understand what kind of OSINT and privacy implications they have. Now, one of the things that I always mentioned uh, in my classes is that there's kind of a relationship between um, your level of privacy and the amount of OSINT we can gather. As you increase privacy, you decrease OSINT opportunities. Less information is being released to the public, and so it's harder to find information. But conversely, as you have more information that's published about you or that you publish out to the internet uh, through social media and other platforms, opportunities to OSINT uh, increase many, many fold. And your privacy, of course decreases. Now, this information is something that's kind of foundational to OSINT. We know that the more information that's pushed out there, we can grab it, analyze it, and sometimes that information is, is published not just about us, not just from us, but about us by our loved ones, by our coworkers, or by those people that are just we're interacting with on a daily basis or something. So John and I took a look at a bunch of different sites that have reviews and ratings, as well as information about food and drink sites as well. Um, so some of the sites uh, with food, with uh, reviews and ratings, what we're looking here is more like the Yelps, the TripAdvisors, um, and some other places that have some interesting things that we can do from an OSINT perspective. Yeah, we're going to start here with uh, Yelp, which probably most of you are familiar with. If you're not, it's a review site um, where people can put in reviews for restaurants and other businesses and talk about their experience there. Um, in this case, we sort of randomly picked a user. We were looking for someone that had a lot of reviews. Uh, in this case, it was a guy named Brent. Uh, he's a Yelp elite, which is sort of their uh, one of their tiers for people that do a lot of reviews. And uh, as you can see here, they've truncated his last name. So we just have Brent B uh, as far as identifying him. But let's take a look at this and see if we can identify a little more information. Um, one of the things you could do is just take his name and some of the information from his, you know, reviews or what he says in his profile. 
one of the other things that you might be able to do is an image search. Um, and in this case, that's what we did. Mike, if you could advance that slide. There we go. Okay. It's gone. Um, so doing a simple Google image search, uh, if you haven't done this before, you have an option to do different kinds of searches in Google, news, uh, images, et cetera. And other search engines also provide image searches, such as Bing. In this case, we just took that image from the Yelp profile, and we did a search with that. That, uh, right on the first page, came up with a, uh, a setup for him on avo.com, which is a website of lawyers. So immediately we have his last name here. We have some other details, uh, like he's an attorney, what kind of attorney, where he's located at, or at least was at that time. As we move forward, we'll see that he is no longer in Florida where he had been before. Um, so that's a little outdated, but doing OSINT, sometimes you don't always get the most up-to-date information. You have to work through it and analyze it. Uh, going through his AVO profile, we also have his street address, the college he went to, full name as I mentioned, um, practice areas, and a lot more details that we could continue to pivot from. Um, now that we have an address and a full name, pretty simple to move around from that. And here we have uh, found his Facebook account. Again, we've got more images here, more friends of his, more details from him on, you know, himself. So just with a couple of quick clicks, we've gone from this semi uh, obfuscated name of a user on Yelp, and now we've got a Facebook account and a lot of detailed information about him. And before many of you start dropping off the call going, oh, this is another one of those reverse image search, I can find the person thing, just stay with us for a little bit. Um, because the reality is, is that many times it's that simple. It really is. You know, the, the users are publishing so much information. Now, as John mentioned, Brent is one of these Yelp elites, one of these people that loves to geolocate themselves and submit reviews of all the places that they're going to. And so what John and I did was we, we, we recognized that it was, it's really easy to do the reverse lookups. You look at their usernames or other things across other sites. So we dive, and dived a little deeper or dove a little deeper. And what we decided to do was look at his Yelp elite kind of posts and, and look at what he was actually posting, that content of it. And in fact, what John did was he went through these posts that Brent did and he pulled out what date the post was made, where the location was that they supposedly checked in, the address, the city state zip made this wonderful little spreadsheet for us to do um, when we were analyzing it. Now, right off the bat, you can look at this spreadsheet and, and see there's some really interesting things going on here. Now, I don't know if you're a person that's ever used Yelp. Or I actually have used it, but not from a, a review perspective, from an OSIN perspective, and also from a, hey, where's a place to eat around here perspective. But when you have somebody that's rating hundreds and thousands of re restaurants and movie theaters and other things, you start to see some interesting stuff. For instance, here we have lines one through seven were all entered on 321 2018. Now, it's absolutely possible that he could have done that, but when we start looking in the D column on 321 2018, he went ahead and reviewed a place in Orlando, a place in Baltimore, another place in a different city in Orlando, a place in Bethesda, Maryland, another place in Florida, and a place in Washington, D.C. And then we have Cocoa Beach as well in Florida. So, so in that one day, there were seven or eight different check-ins that he had where he reviewed different places. Now, it is absolutely possible that Brent could have visited these places in the past, written notes, and on 321, he sat down, he's like, all right, I'm going to do all my Yelp reviews, and he pushed them in. But it's also possible that those are fake reviews, or that those reviews are for places that he's never, ever been, or maybe he was asked to write them by the owners, or by, or maybe he was paid to write them. 
those are kind of the questions that John and I asked ourselves as we started to look through this data. And, you know, when we were looking through this data, we figured out that, well, doing it in a in a uh, non-automated fashion, while it, it was, it proved uh, valuable, um, putting that all in the Excel spreadsheet, it was also time consuming. And I know a little bit of Python, so I volunteered to write something. And what I did was I found that every single place that somebody reviewed on Yelp, can the their rating or review was there as we see on the right hand side we've got five stars on 9 30 2018 for the carving room on 300 massachusetts ave in northwest washington dc so we have a location i have a date i have their rating and i also have the address what i found is that you could iterate through all of these different pages of reviews and the url uh, and that you see at the bottom of the screen there with rec underscore page start equals 10. We could just iterate through and say, well, show me the records for that start at page and that start at record 20, record 30, record 40. And really simply, you could iterate through all of the reviews that a user had had submitted. And well, if we're going to do that, then we might as well write a tool, right? Of course we should. Now, I went ahead and created this github.com WebReacher food and drink repository on GitHub. It's out there right now. And what it does, I've blacked out the whole center where the usernames are just to kind of protect a little bit of the anonymity of the, the people we're looking at here. But this is what the, the actual tool does. You run it, you pass it a user ID, a Yelp user ID. And it will go through and iterate through all of the locations that they have been. Then it takes each one of those addresses, sends it off to Google via the Google API. Google will then translate that into GPS coordinates and say, oh, you're looking at 300 Massachusetts Avenue in Washington, D.C. That's GPS coordinate latitude comma longitude. Well, once we have a whole bunch of latitudes and longitude, it's trivial to go ahead and take that and plot it on a Google map and then we can analyze it. And what I found was really, really interesting with this, with these Yelp reviews. I will caveat this. When I first wrote this script, I did it in a hacker technique. You know, hey, I don't need to get an API key to Google or anything like that. I'm just going to go ahead and scrape the web page and then make calls and it'll be fine. Well, it didn't go fine. And Google changed their API for geocoding such that you do have to sign up for an account. And that's that's where you need that Google API key. And if you go to the WebReacher food and drink GitHub repository, you'll see on the README page that you do need to add, the uh, you need to sign up for a Google API key for the geocoding and also for the JavaScript map API as well. And once you do that and go through that little hassle, what you get is some really cool information about where that person has reviewed. Each one of these black dots on the map actually represents one of their check-ins, one of their reviews. We've also got a kind of a heat map thing going on here. If you can see in the lower portion of this screen, we have Florida. And then in the upper right of the screen, we see Washington, DC. There's a red circle around Florida. For those of you that can see that, indicating that more check-ins were in that area. Uh, but then the map isn't just static. Let me go ahead and just run this quick uh, video here that shows you what it's like. When you actually zoom in, you can see exactly where this person has checked in. Here we see that some places in Tampa, but more places around Kissimmee and Orlando, um, this is where he's checked in more often. Now, we could then tie this to specific check-ins and, and find out what he said about this place. But really what I'm looking at at this point is the groupings of where he checked in. You see the high, high level of grouping right there in the middle. This might be a place that he frequents, maybe he works there, maybe he lives in this area or just travels there a bunch. And then if we zoom out, we can go ahead up to Washington DC area and do the same thing and dive in there and see what places this person has frequented. The one thing that I don't like about Yelp is that Yelp represents a one-time check-in. So at one point in time, somebody said, I'm going to review this place. And, you know, that's okay. 
but it doesn't necessarily mean that that person's ever going to go back there. So it's not a repeated type of activity. But if we are looking for repeated activities, I decided to take this exact same technique and then apply it to other applications, other websites like ratebeer.com. Ratebeer.com has a really neat interface uh, website. This information is public. And again, if you've seen some of my other talks about how people are publishing their drinking activity publicly, I, I still can't understand how people do this, but people do. So this person, Chudwick, uh, we'll just take for an example, has a profile that's public. And um, the URL to get to his profile is something like ratebeer.com slash user slash and then a number. 11111 is not his actual user ID. But here we actually see that this is the HTML version of the ratebeer.com page. One of the things I always like doing is try to find out if there's another view of that page. And sure enough, there's a Ajax version or asynchronous JavaScript and XML version that doesn't have all those pretty icons and pretty fonts in there, but it does give us all of the information in a way that's really easy to scrape using a Python script. So what we did is the exact same type of thing. And we see now the places where this person has checked in um, on ratebeer.com. The exact same thing happens here. We can see that he's got some activity in France. We can dive in and we see that this person uh, lives uh, somewhere in the triangle between Louisville, Lexington, and that's Cincinnati. With most of the places that he's checked into for this, for where he's drank beers in the Lexington, I mean, in the Cincinnati area. We can even dive deeper and see which actual place he went to um, in case we want to, to do that. So I was like, well, this is, this is kind of neat. Um, I, you know, let's, let's go ahead and take this and revisit something that I had done before. It, it, for those of you that do remember the untapped work that I did, uh, essentially with the untapped website, the last 25 beers that somebody has drank uh, are public if their person if their profile is public so you can just type in untapped.com slash user slash whatever name and then you pull up their profile as i did here with dean c in st louis park minnesota now you could see dean c is one of those frequent drinkers he or frequent logger of his drinkers uh drinkers wow good english micah um so we have on the left hand side 4,380 total beers that this user has logged. Doesn't necessarily mean that he drank them, but it does mean that he logged them. If we go ahead and change that user URL a little bit and add the slash venues to the end of it, what we now see is the aggregation of how many beers this user, Dean C, has drank or logged at a certain location. So for the first one there, Steel Toe Brewing, at a certain location, he first visited in March 15th, 2013, and most recently visited July 22nd, 2017. Is that useful from an OSINT perspective? Oh, absolutely. Now again, this might not be accurate information. There's nothing that says he has to visit a place in order to check in there, but He's got 59 check-ins to the Steel Trail Brewing Place and 41 at McCoy's Public House. And he's got 22 at Surly. So if we start grabbing that information and then doing that geocoding, um, I, of course, have the untapped scraper script that's in a different repository on my GitHub that also requires a Google API key. But this is what it does. It grabs that exact section of the URL, the untapped.com slash user slash whatever the username is slash venues. And by adding on the sort equals highest check-in, we get the most frequently checked in place at the top of the list. So we get where they're we're more frequently visiting. If you have the Google API key and add it according to the readme that's on the site, it will do the steel toad brewing that address and it will geocode it to 44.94 whatever there using that Google API.
And of course, if we have that, we can find out where this person drinks more frequently. The thing that I've done here is each one of these markers will tell you what the name of the place is and how many drinks they have logged at it. So we can zoom in here to Minneapolis and we can see over here, we've got a red area to the lower left. We've got places up here in Prospect Park, 15 beers, nine beers drank, a couple of places over here with 10, 22 beers. So this represents probably, oh, there's the 59 beers. 14, and then finally the 41 beers. So if I was to find, try to figure out where this person most frequently hung out, I would probably say in this Wolf Park area, that's where they, they've logged more of their, their drinking. And I have those numbers too, because this person has public information on the internet. Okay, so earlier we had alluded to the idea that there might be people doing reviews for places they hadn't been or um, not saying that our initial example was doing that, but that, that is a possibility when you start seeing a bunch of reviews for different cities on the same day, for example. Um, so we took a look into this and there definitely is a good bit of this going on out there. Um, there's a pretty good trade in it, actually. Here on the slide, uh, we have Fiverr, which is a site where people can basically offer offer quick jobs for you know for whatever sum of money they want to ask from random people. Uh, it's a freelance marketplace basically, and this guy's offering you know Google reviews and that sort of thing. Um, a lot of these actors are located outside of the United States. And it doesn't really matter. They're not really going to visit these sites, for example, uh, or, you know, if it's in Europe, they, they don't have to be there, right? Um, a lot of these reviews also, there's two ways that, that you're looking at fake reviews, right? Um, either you're a user that is maybe trying to find a good place to eat, or maybe you're doing some OSINT and you're trying to track some people down, um, there are some tells that you can find if people are doing these reviews, and we'll go into that a little bit. Uh, what you will find, though, is that there are a lot of, of services that will offer this, and they'll just create some users, and they'll, they'll kind of earn them and do the reviews, and then they'll set up some more. There are websites out there that offer this service, and sometimes it's pretty blatant, like the website you can see here on the slide, sometimes it's not as obvious. Uh, it may be uh, presented as search engine optimization. We'll get more hits and reviews on your site, and it's not necessarily explained, perhaps, to the purchaser that they're buying fake reviews. Um, a lot of these reviews, obviously, are for a uh, business that wants positive reviews. They're trying to drive business to their establishment. On the other hand, you may also have uh, reviews that are negative, where people are trying to knock out the competition, basically, by giving bad reviews to other restaurants in their neighborhood or that they might be competitive with, for example. Those would probably be more likely to result in issues because the recipients of those fake reviews might bring those up with Yelp or someone else indicating that they might be fake reviews. There are some forms out there, uh, there's an example here on this slide, that have a lot of this sort of activity going on. People come on and say, hey, I need good reviews for this, or offering to sell reviews for that website, or you know, it's all over the place. It's a very open market for this. And this is kind of tied in with the search engine optimization where people are trying to try business to their sites and, uh, and to their restaurants or uh, other forms of business. The false reviews are, as I said, sometimes very blatant about what they are selling. As you can see here, this advertisement uh, doesn't really make any pretenses about what it's doing. But you may also find some, some search engine, social media services type organizations that are selling, driving business to you, getting you more clients 
So they may not necessarily be obvious in stating that they are basically going to give you a bunch of fake reviews for your money. And obviously this is, you know, with your restaurant and hotels and businesses like that, but this also extends to, you know, video views on YouTube and likes on Facebook, Instagram followers, and all of those sorts of things. You can see an advertisement here on that same forum that we showed earlier. And, you know, you can pretty much buy anything. Some of these are driven by what you would call account takeovers, where people just take over accounts. Some of them, they're essentially creating sock puppets and doing reviews or just following people on Twitter, whatever. And some of them are essentially... There's something called credit stuffing uh, or credential stuffing where they automatedly take uh, login information from different breaches or leaked data, and then they will run this against, say, Twitter users. And then they can take over a bunch of accounts and essentially run these as if they're their own accounts. They just take them over. So you'll have that as a resource as well. So there's sort of some criminal activity going on here, and there's quite a bit of it. There's a real market for it. There are people out there with businesses that don't mind doing some shady things to get their business going. So uh, one of the outcomes of this kind of is that you, you do need to be careful about what you're getting, either when you're doing OSINT research. Is this user really a person? Are they really doing these reviews? Uh, or just as a user of some of these review sites, you, you know have to be a little bit cautious about what is actually a good review, what is not a good review. There are some sites like fakespot.com where you can essentially take a restaurant or some sort of business from Yelp or product on Amazon, and they've got an algorithm that detects, okay, this is a review by a new user. They've only done one review ever. It's a really glowing review. It's a chance this is maybe a fake review. Someone manufactured this review. Uh, and you can use some of those resources to test these things out. They're not perfect, but they can give you an idea of what is happening with that review or that facility or service that has a bunch of reviews. Excuse me, a bunch of reviews. Thanks, John. So we looked at those things. We, we thought about how OSINTERS, uh, many of us are already aware that there's a lot of false data on the internet. Some of it is propaganda based where people are trying to sway our opinions. Some of them are trying to focus our money in certain places. We uh, There were some wonderful YouTube videos out there that show how in certain places in the world they will have banks of mobile devices and people get paid to go and submit five-star ratings on each one of the devices to amp up the the Amazon rating of a certain product. Um, so this type of of concept of uh, paid for ratings is something that that we kind of know about. However, if you ask people out there in the world, if you ask your mother, father, sister, brother, spouse, children, what do you use when you to know which is a good site? Or what do you use when you, when you look for a great product? People say ratings. I mean, how many times have, have you or a coworker gone to Yelp and looked for a rating of a restaurant? You're like, oh, well, it, it gets four and a half stars on Yelp. It must be good. Well, what if that stuff is false? You're making your decision based upon er erroneous information. Now, the title of the talk is Watching You Eat, Drink, and Sleep. And we thought, how creepy would it be if we could actually watch people while they sleep? And so we didn't do any of that stuff. What we did do is look into other types of kind of vacation, hotel, and other type of travel sites. And we found some stuff on Airbnb. Now. Before we get into Airbnb specifically, uh, we did look at a bunch of other travel sites, as I mentioned, everything from TripAdvisor to Zagat to other places. And, and what we found was a variety of, I guess security is what I would call it. We, saw, we found things like this. This is, these ratings on the slide here are from a cruise ship company. And 
it's neat. It says, you know, by error C, uh, was a member that joined in 2005, two reviews written, but you can't get to by error C's profile to see their picture or when they made the reviews or what they were made it of. So it might be that they've got some great security going on there and, and this is a valid person, but part of me thinks, well, if I can't tell that you're a real person, how do I know that this site isn't just going ahead and manufacturing these reviews and posting them as members or something like that. So my skeptical meter really kind of spikes on these things. Now, shifting back to Airbnb, um, we found some really interesting things there. Now, if you've never used Airbnb, Air Bed and Breakfast, it, it's a place that you can use to find a home a condo, an apartment in a different part of the world or in your local city that you can rent from somebody that owns it. So if I have a, a place at the beach and I want people to go ahead and rent it while I'm not there, I can put it up as a host. I will be a host on Airbnb and guests can say, oh, I want to stay there. And then they can come and uh, pay me money and stay at my place. Now, the neat thing that I found when looking through this was not necessarily the, oh, we can find this person from their picture. We could, uh, Jada up there was really easy to find based upon the information that she provided in her profile picture and her profile, uh, just her the profile information. But what we saw was we have a two-way type of rating system here where Jada, as the guest, can rate the host. And the host, like Charlie in this picture, can rate the guest. And I was browsing through many of these comments and just looking at, you know, that kind of the, oh, so-and-so was a terrific guest. They were so clean and neat. And it got me started thinking, you know, hey, Jada here went on a trip and stayed at Charlie's place in Wilmington, North Carolina. Cool. Well, she rated his place and then Charlie rated um, her and said, hey, Jada and Christian were perfect guests, blah, blah, blah. But what if Jada's husband is not Christian, but Bob? Now, Charlie doesn't know that. He just says, hey, the two people I met, I'm going to put their names in here. And what we see is we see this done a lot because these guests want to be personable. They want to say that they know and understand who's staying at their place. And so the comments from the hosts were actually pretty interesting to read. Because that gives us a little bit more insight. Sometimes they would disclose, oh, Jada and her family of four kids were just so adorable. Little Bobby was, and they give us more information, even though Jada probably didn't give him permission to do anything like that. Now, of course, Christian might be her husband or Christian might be um, her brother or whatever. And I'm not saying that, that Jada is cheating on anybody. But the opportunity exists from an OSINT perspective to scour the comments on some of these, these home sharing rating sites to find interesting information. Now, while we were looking at Airbnb, we found some other things that kind of made us remember something. Um, I don't know if you ever seen uh, Josh Huff. Uh, he's probably listening. Hey, Josh, uh, well done there, man. Uh, Josh has a... Um, website, a blog at learnallthethings.net. The URL is right there. What Josh did was he looked at Facebook IDs, you know, those account, those unique identifiers that say this person, Micah Hoffman, ha has this UID, this account number. And Facebook does this so that multiple people with the name Micah Hoffman can use the name Micah Hoffman. You know, it just, for its records, it uses that user ID or UID in order to um, figure out what content is tagged to which user. What Josh did was he figured out from people's face anniversaries when those accounts were created to the month and the year. And then he saw that there was a natural progression, uh, not linear, as you can see in this graph here, but it, there was a progression from oldest, which had the lowest numbers uh, for Facebook IDs, to the most recent, which had the largest numbers. And if you look in Michael Bazell's OSINT book that Josh links to in his blog, Josh created a really neat chart that will tell you if you have a Facebook ID with this number 
or in this range, it was probably created between this month and year. So what John and I did while we were looking at this information is we kind of remembered that I did something like this back in 2015 with Strava. With Strava, I noticed that if I incremented a user ID, which was just a number, I could pull up somebody else's profile. And sure enough, if we do that here on Airbnb and we go to airbnb.com slash users slash show slash enter their user ID, we might pull up Jada. But if we change that number, just increment it or decrement it, we pull up somebody else's account. And so one could wonder, hey, if we did that enough, could we come up with our own chart of approximate dates when certain account user IDs were created? And sure enough, John and I were able to do that very, very simply. I will warn you, this chart is not entirely accurate. This is a rough rough user mapping. We took a very small sample and kind of mapped what the year they were, they those user accounts were were created in. And we could do that because if you look at the image on the left where it says, hey, I'm Logan, US joined in October 2017. So if you take that October 2017 along with Logan's actual Airbnb user ID, then we can make this chart. Now this chart is very rough. It's not exact at all, but it kind of gives you an idea that you could, because all of these Airbnb user IDs are pretty public, you could grab a whole bunch of the user IDs and then make a very detailed chart to, to use in your open source intelligence. So we kind of did a, a shotgun approach of showing you a whole bunch of different uh, areas, whether it's Yelp reviews or whether it's Airbnb. We kind of wanted to leave you with some overall impressions that we wanted to, well, that we wanted to share. Um, and, and so, you know, from a, a perspective of a user, if we are going to use social media, first off, it, it really is your personal risk-based decision. Now, if you've heard me talk to other places, you understand that I use this personal risk-based decision all the time to refer to the fact that in your work, many of you are doing cybersecurity or you're doing uh, cyber threat intelligence or you're doing other types of evaluation of data and then determining risk to a person, to an organization, or to something else. This is business. But when you use social media, when your family, when your friends, when your colleagues use social media, you're also making that same type of risk-based decision of, do I post this? Do I tweet this? Do I geolocate this? Do I rate this? You're just doing it based upon, or you're doing it with your personal information up for grabs. So you have to decide what's, what's comfortable for you to post, what's comfortable for you to share on these sites. Now. One of the other things that I wanted to just bring up briefly is that some of these websites, some of these social media sites, you, you probably know them, you can turn on some security flags that prevent people from getting access to your data. You can submit those pictures, but only people in your circles or only people that are in your friends list will go ahead and get access to it. Cool, you're limiting who can see it, that those posts, and that's terrific. But that doesn't mean that the platform itself isn't doing these types of analysis on your behavior and what you're doing. So if you're sharing stuff on Facebook to only your friends, Facebook may be looking at, okay, Facebook is looking at that data to determine what you're doing, where you're going, who you're doing it with, and other platforms do similar stuff. So one of the things I always try to, to help people understand is that Limiting who has access to your data does not include that platform itself, so Twitter, Instagram, uh, Weibo, VK. Those platforms, once you submit your information, those system administrators many times, those database administrators many times will have access to that data, whether you say, hey, I want them to or not. Uh, in the news recently, we found things like Twitter, said that their system administrators have access to read people's direct messages. <gasps> if they're direct messages, why are other people reading them? It should just be between me and the other person that's reading the message, but no, 
they said that, yeah, their administrators do have access to read those messages. And Facebook has done things like in 2013, they had a study that was actually published by two of their employees in a journal, uh, like a, a real peer reviewed journal. And it uh, analyzed the censorship, the self censorship that Facebook users did. So when you type a really ranty tweet, uh, ranty post, and you're like, oh, I hate you, Aunt Marge. I can't believe you did this. And But before you send it, you delete it, whew, it didn't go out. But every single character that a person sends or types to Facebook, they record. And what they do is they store that. Then they allowed 31 million of those self-censured posts to be reviewed over 17 days. Um, with, for some of their employees, and those employees did some info, did some analysis on that. So we understand that these platforms many times are harvesting and analyzing our data. Obviously, if your data is out there in the public sphere, it can be scraped, harvested, downloaded, archived, analyzed. Uh, we see this all the time with Twitter, with Instagram. Just there are a huge bunch of other sites like Yelp, like TripAdvisor that also provide opportunities for data gathering and analysis. So if you're listening to this webcast as a person that uses social media, some suggestions. One, use a pseudonym. Don't use Micah Hoffman. Well, I please don't use Micah Hoffman. I'll use Micah Hoffman. But but what I would say is that if your name is Micah Hoffman, pick a different name to do your Yelp reviews on up on Yelp reviews through. So my Yelp account might be Bob Smith or something like that. And as John showed, you know, consider not showing your face. Consider not um, uploading pictures of the front part of your face. It, you can do other things like of your hand or of a location or other things. But that face is many times coming into play as more and more platforms are doing facial recognition, as more and more platforms are analyzing who's appearing in what pictures, at what date, at what time. So consider not uh, showing or posting your face. And then one of the other things is try not to provide your real hometown. Honestly, this recommendation doesn't really come into play that much, but um, I did one of these Yelp reviews as John and I were working on the, the scripts and stuff in the talk. I did one of the Yelp reviews for a person that said her hometown was Fayetteville, North Carolina. I was like, cool, you know, on her Yelp profile it says Fayetteville, North Carolina. And when I ran where she had reviewed, she had not reviewed anything in the state of North Carolina. All of her reviews were in Denver, Colorado. And so I'm thinking, well, yeah, maybe she identifies as, as a person that was born in that state, but Realistically, with the with the the geolocation of these reviews of these beers that are drank or whatever, it's pretty easy to see through where you might be located. And then, you know, if you do want to use social media, you might want to consider creating a fictitious person to you that you can use the platform as. If I really want to use the untapped beer drinking application, I could create that Bob Smith account and log all my beers as Bob. Of course, at some point, somebody may be able to say, wait a second, you know, this person was in this place and that place and this place, huh? I'm thinking that that's not Bob Smith. That might be Mike Hoffman. So again, uh, make your own personal risk-based decisions here to decrease or remove your prof your social media profiles as you see fit. So many of you online are probably not listening to this just as a user of these sites, but uh, are doing OSINT research or investigator of some sort. So some of the things that we kind of brought forth from our research here is aggregation of the data can be pretty useful. Um, if you're collecting information on somebody and you're just finding that they have reviewed a bunch of things on Yelp and then, okay, here's um, you know their username, here's a picture of them, and then just run off and go towards other things, you might be missing some stuff there. If you can collect all that information uh, and put it together, there might be some useful things that you can take out of that. 
and following on that, you might want to become familiar with some of the tools for collecting and storing these sorts of things, uh, whether that's doing some Python scripting, using tools like Micah has created that he has on his GitHub, or getting familiar with you know SQLite databases and how you can load information into those so that you can really analyze some information it would be a useful thing for you perhaps. And also you can use some tools like Data Miner is a, a Chrome plugin that basically makes scraping some of these sites pretty easy. You can create uh, all the fields that you want to collect from a certain kind of a page like a Yelp review and select you know this field this field this field this field pull those all out drop them into a you know like a csv file or something that you can then manipulate and analyze so these are some of the things that you might want to look at doing if you're doing OSINT regularly is collecting larger amounts of data than you know you're just going to put into your uh, your report maybe to a client you might collect a huge volume of information if they're very active online, if they have a lot of tweets, for example, if they you know, do a lot of reviews or travel a lot uh, on Airbnb, you might find them. And you can put this information together and maybe come up with some pretty useful nuggets of information. Also, following up on our discussion of fake reviews, what we saw with that initial Yelp review from Brent where there were seven or eight reviews in all these different cities. Now that may have just been he entered the reviews for that date. It may also be that someone is putting reviews out there to obfuscate where they actually were or to you know spread some false information. Maybe it's a fake review happening for some monetary purpose, but as you're aware, it may not be truthful what is out there that you are seeing. There could be other explanations. It may not be specifically an attempt to fool you. It may just be that this is when the person logged on and entered these reviews or whatever. But you do need to keep in mind that some of this information out there might not be as exact as we would want when we're conducting an OSINT investigation. That's a very important point, John. Um, I, what I find is people are really enthusiastic about running tools. If you look at the some of the stuff that comes through on the Twitter sphere, there are people that are saying, "Hey, look at this tool, look at that tool, look at this plugin, look at that." Um, it's the analysis of that data that you collect that is so so important, and that many people either do really well and get some amazing results out of, or fall a little bit short. And I think that for me, that's where a lot of the, the training, a lot of the experience, and a lot of the conversations I've had with a lot of my friends are because as you are exposed to more and more parts of OSINT that are truthful, that are not truthful, that where you've seen things done, um, you become uh, more capable of deciding what alternatives might be actually out there for that data. What other reasons are there? And with that, uh, we've come to the end of our presentation with about 10 minutes to spare. I do want to do a quick plug. This is this is SANS and this is Open Source Intelligence. So I do want to do a quick plug for uh, the SEC 487 class that John and I are teaching. It's uh, six days and we've got a huge number of locations and there are more that are in the works. I just couldn't fit them on the slide here, including something that's really neat. In February of 2019, we have an OSINT Summit, which is one day of a whole bunch of talks just like this one by people that are leading OSINT experts in the, um, in the, in the world. And they are gonna be coming to Alexandria, Virginia for a, a day and talking to you, hopefully, about OSINT topics. And with that, I'd like to say thank you and open up the floor. Uh, actually, I'd like to turn this back over to Carol. All right, thanks for that great presentation. We have quite a few questions uh, already in the, in the Q&A here, so I'm gonna jump in and get started. Uh, first of all, what was that site John mentioned with the algorithm to discover fake reviews? Okay, sorry, I, I, uh, we probably should have put that on the slide there. Uh, it's called fakespot.com, and there's a couple other sites like it, but that's probably one of the better known ones. 
and you can just go to that site and drop a link in for, you know, a restaurant on Yelp or, like I said, a product on Amazon or, uh, uh, you know, a TripAdvisor, that sort of thing. And it'll run its algorithm on it and basically tell you 70% of these reviews look sketchy. You know, you might want to be cautious about taking all these reviews in good faith. Uh, again, that's fakespot.com. All right, thank you. Are you finding that some of the social media firms are keeping information in other countries? I will say that I don't know about that. Um, I don't know about where they would be storing the information. I, I'm guessing that this is because uh, some countries are more lax with their privacy laws than others, uh, specifically thinking about probably GDPR. But I don't. I really haven't done any and done any research uh, into where what countries places are are storing information. I did hear about some people, some companies storing things in Ireland, but I can't remember that. John, do you remember anything? Do you have any yeah, thoughts? Ireland has been a place um, because it's within the EU where where some large social media networks have been storing information. Um, but they, you know. They have very broad networks and data centers all over the world. Uh, they, if they can, can have all this information in a central location, they'll do that. But sometimes country laws restrict that, so they may just keep that information, if possible, in one area. Uh, that, we could probably do a whole talk on, on that sort of thing. <laughs> um, but I don't have exact answers for you on that. But they do move their data around, and they do have spaces specifically they, where they will keep specific country or regional data. All right, thank you. I'm going to read this exactly as it's phrased. Uh, they say, is there a way to sort of view your online footprint? Sort of view your online what? Footprint. Footprint. Um, yes, I there is. I don't mean by sort of view it. <laughs> <laughs> that means with just one eye. So yes, keep one eye closed and just look at it sort of through. Now, I I think that the question is more, is there an easy button method? And I'll read into this. Is there an easy button method where you could visit one site and say, hey, tell me what I look like across all my social media? And and the answer, if that is the question, is there are some places that will tell you they will do this. Uh, from what I've seen, many of them don't do it well. There's some of the credit reporting agencies will say, hey, for an extra fee, we'll, we'll scour social media, we'll look in the dark web for information about you, about your accounts. And I haven't really tested a lot of those, but I know from my personal experience, much of the information that we find when we're doing OSINT investigations is from that manual work. Uh, yes, we'll run tools, but there's a lot of false positive checking in. So it is intensive. My suggestion, actually, John, do you know of, of professional tools that people could use or anything like that? No, I, I think it really is kind of a matter of, of doing your own OSINT on yourself and seeing what you come up with. I don't think there's one central location. And I do know uh, from personal experience, some of these, you know, like uh, credit monitoring tools that monitor the dark web and stuff. I, I don't put a lot of stock in those. I think I got an alert for one of those through one of my credit cards one time that was for some data leak from, you know, five years ago. It's like, great. Okay. <laughs> That's not real useful. Um, so uh, I don't think there's a, a go-to location where you can do that. Um, I think you are better off just doing some OSINT on yourself and seeing what you come up with. All right, thank you. What are some examples of how employers are using OSINT to vet potential candidates? I think I'm going to I'm going to defer that. Like John said earlier in just a little bit ago, that's like a, that's not the topics that we have talked about here. Um, and there's a whole bunch of information about that on, on the internet and other places. I'd prefer to keep the topics uh, that we talk about here uh, focused on the, the, the webcast for right now. All right, sounds good. <laughs> I don't know if this falls in the same category, but they ask, do you find that people with unusual names are easier to hunt than, for example, Bob Smith? John, why don't you take this one? 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if there's a very unusual name that that makes it much simpler to filter out the false positives. If you have a, a Bob Smith or a Harry Jones, you're quite possibly going to spend a lot of time filtering out the, the correct subject from other people with that name. Even if you have, you know, one city that you know they're in and can sort it by that, you still are going to have a lot of people probably with that name. And you're going to have the problem also of is this, once you have information that seems valid, being 100% certain that that is actually the right person, the subject of your search. So doing research on people with uncommon names is certainly much simpler. All right. Someone says, if the unusual name is a real person, correct? <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, is there a way for a person to check whether a person like you guys <laughs> is performing OSINT on them. For example, your name is being searched several hundred times over two to three, two to three days, for example. From my perspective, there are a couple of platforms that will tell you what accounts are looking at your information. Uh, for instance, LinkedIn has the LinkedIn premium that you can get a 30-day trial for, and you can see, look, these people are looking at my profile. Uh, however, if we as OSINTers are aware of this, what we'll do is we'll use a series of different sock puppet accounts or fake accounts or whatever to look at your account over those days. So you won't necessarily see the same account hitting your account many different times. You'll see a, just a bunch of recruiters hitting your account and it looks kind of normal. The, the challenge with other account, other platforms is that many times you don't have access to their data analytics, their what web pages are being hit most. When I was doing the lookup of these Yelp reviews, I wasn't even logged in as a valid Yelp user. So it was just anonymous access. And I don't think that many platforms give out that information to their, their users. All right, thank you. Do you have a link to a good list of tools? <laughs> yes, it's on the screen right now, www.sans.org slash sec487. We talk about all the tools, all the best tools. Um, no, don't talk about tools. Uh, tools are just things we use. Nobody says, hey, show me how to get the best list of forks and spoons. We talk about how to how to get place settings. We talk about how to use those place settings to serve a meal or to consume a meal. We talk about the recipes for making the food. The, the tools are a way to accomplish OSINT. If you focus on learning the tools, then you're, you're missing the point of OSINT, which is that analysis of the data that was aggregated. You can obviously go to OSINTframework.com or technizet.com or any one of these other web frameworks. Uh, Bruno Mortier has one, and there's a ton of these start.me pages. Just search for them online. Do some OSINT to find these frameworks. And there's a ton of tools in there, but, but don't learn OSINT by, by, by learning the tools that will gather it. Sorry for the rant. It's it's one of my pet peeves. John, do you have ideas? What where do people find tools? I think you you gave some good places <laughs> to go to, and that was a very good point. You, you know, there's more to it than just running some tools. There's there's a lot more involved. All right, thanks. Uh, someone asks, can you can you use this to find fake news? John, I'm sorry. Can you repeat that? Can you use this to find fake news? Ah, um, well, I don't know if you can use travel uh, advisory and Yelp sites to find fake news. Um, you certainly could, if you wanted to, do some research with Twitter and some of these other platforms and find bots and uh, and try and find fake news, but it's definitely outside the scope of, of what we're discussing with this webcast. It absolutely can be done. There, there are people that, that track that sort of stuff. All right, thanks. Is the OSINT Summit free? The OSINT Summit is not free. 
I'm not sure of the actual pricing, but it is on, if you go to sans.org, SEC 487, at the bottom of the page, you'll see on February 26th in Alexandria, you'll see the OSINT Summit. You can click on that and head over to that the OSINT Summit page and check out uh, what the, whatever SANS has set the cost for. Do you guys have any contact information if someone wants to reach out to you directly? Um, maybe you already presented that. Hmm. I don't think we did present that. We've, we provided our Twitter feed, our Twitter handles. Okay. Um, okay. That was on the front slide. Maybe we could go back to that so that the, yeah, the person that. requesting that would have a minute to, uh, to write that down. Thank you. All right, while you're, while you're pulling that up, I'll move on to the next question. Are there any services that can erase your digital footprint, for example, your social media presence? So you could essentially start from zero. John, I think the best resource that I've found is Michael Bazell's A Privacy Workbook that he gives away free on his, it's a PDF that he gives away on his uh, main website, inteltechniques.com. It's, uh, yeah, it's, that's a great resource. Yeah, it, it's really in-depth. And again, that's Michael Bazell's website, inteltechniques.com. He has a PDF there that's like a privacy workbook and really detailed, and it goes very, very deep. He, he also has a, a great podcast on privacy. All right, thanks. Do you guys have a couple more minutes for two more questions? Yeah, I do. Yeah, we're, sure. We're a little over. Uh, what's the best way to get started with a career in the world of OSINT? It's not really a small question, I guess. <laughs> yeah. John, what do you think? Well, uh, I would say start um, networking and, and getting out there with uh, either investigators or lawyers or, you know, on the information security side where people are doing this sort of work and, um, you know, just start talking to some of these people. Um, if you actually have been doing some OSINT type work and know what you're doing, there's definitely people out there that will hire you and you just kind of need to get out there and talk to some of these people. Um, you know, keep working on what you're doing as far as learning OSINT, you can just randomly pick people and, and kind of do investigations if you'd like and, you know, work on your chops. You can, can use some of the tools like Mike has created, do some of your own scripting and, and get out there and blog about it and tweet about it. And those things will, you know, be useful for getting jobs when you're applying for them as well. Yeah, I agree with what John says a lot. Uh, that OSINT and cybersecurity are two fields that are really quite interesting that you don't have to go and pay thousands of dollars to get a specific tool or you don't have to get a, a license to go ahead and start understanding how social media and how people search engines and how the dark web all works together. There are some places that can give you uh, great jump starts. For instance, we mentioned Michael Bazell's Intel Technique site. He's got a whole bunch of information on there. He also has a, a great book that's, I think, about $40. And on his website, he, the book is uh, linked from there. It's on Amazon. It's like $40 on OSIN Techniques. And you could take that and, and start understanding how things are work. There's also people like myself that have the SEC 487 uh, it's OSINT course, which is an, a, a great foundational course that teaches a lot of different areas. We touch on a lot of different areas of OSINT, um, but people like Justin Seitz have a course that, that they teach if you're more focused on, like John mentioned, maybe learning Python and how Python can help you with open source intelligence. And uh, my, Michael Bazell also has courses. So uh, you choose your own adventure, whether you want to go the free route and listen to talks like this or talks from conferences and and do the self-learning approach, or whether you want to go ahead and, and take a more formalized class. There's no right way to do it, but I think John's point of you do need to start doing this and trying these things out, not necessarily the tools, but definitely the the how do I find information about this picture, or how do I do reverse image search? The, those techniques, 
and then how they come into play in an overall OSINT investigation. And I guess one of the things that we should mention is there's a great uh, place for people if you want to go and talk to other people, maybe continue the conversation. The OSINT.team rocket chat group is international and has people from all over the world that are talking about everything from dark web to capture the flag kind of OSINT challenges and other things as well. 100% free. And that URL is OSINT dot team and it'll ask you to sign up for a rocket chat account which is either via an application or via a website all right well that's all the time we have for today thank you so much micah and john for your great presentation which helps bring this content to the sans community to our audience we greatly appreciate you listening in for a schedule of all upcoming and archived sans webcasts including this one please visit sands.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next Sands webcast.